Well, uh, four minutes to go, um, but anyway, it's already on Facebook Live. So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, excited to catch up with Richard, uh, who as always is extremely busy. Um, he doesn't stop working, doesn't stop thinking. Uh, so Richard, just tell me, I know you were telling me the other day, you've been doing a lot of uh, things on the media, haven't you, with, with the book? Uh, how's, it, how's it been going? Yeah, I've been doing radio tours. Uh, here, Fox Network is very big. They, I, think, I think they have 740 stations or something. And uh, I've been going through the, <clears throat> the big ones in major cities, and uh, some of them are syndicated through a lot of smaller stations. And uh, But it's, you know, some of the hosts are really good interviewers, and some not so much, and some is morning while the people are driving in, so it's only five or ten minutes. But, uh, you know, it's still nice to let people know I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> alive and kicking. Um, so, Richard, one of the things I was, I was talking to, uh, one of the things that I, I, I know you do, um, and there's quite a lot of questions, but obviously you run the seminars in, in, uh, you run the seminars in London, you also run the seminars in Orlando, and, and then you do other seminars around Europe uh, and, and also in South America. And you do these, you know, scattered throughout the year in like two lots of periods. But then you have a lot of off time, which isn't off time. I know you're extremely busy, always catching up. And give me, give me an update because I know you, you, you've been working on some of your previous books and re-editing them with your new publishing house. Tell me a little bit about that because there's some exciting things in the pipeline, I know. Well, t 12 of the titles, because I started writing books almost 50 years ago, and uh, copyrights are not that long on books. Uh, some of them are 36 years. And uh, a lot of the copyrights on my book ran out. And so I recopyrighted the books. Uh, uh, one of the publishing companies doesn't even, ex actually two of the publishing companies don't really exist anymore. So my original two books, Structure of Magic 1 and 2, uh, Changing with Families, uh, you know, uh, uh, Frogs into Princes, Transformations, you know, Using Your Brain for a Change. A lot of these old books are not in print anymore. Uh, there are a lot of used copies out there, but, uh, you, uh, and they're also not, they're getting a little dated. Uh, you know, times, times have certainly changed in the past 50 years. And also when, being my age, when I look at the very first book that I wrote with John Grinder, you know, we wrote that book because we were trying to make sense out of, of, out of what high quality psychotherapists were doing. Uh, some people got results sometimes and some people got results none of the time. And uh, we were trying to make the difference between when people got results and when they didn't. So The Structure of Magic was a book about language and therapy. But therapy really is kind of a misnomer. I don't really believe in therapy. I, I believe in problem solving. And when I look at the book now, I'm rewriting The Structure of Magic as a book about problem solving. Uh, you don't have to have an emotional problem to use it. Uh, it's not just a guide for therapists to ask better questions. It's going to be a guide for everybody to ask better questions. In the trainings that I've done for the past 50 years and the consulting work, uh, the meta model has served as a great tool. And uh, the way in which a therapist would use it and the way in which you use it in general to solve problems is not really the same as it was then. So to make this book more current and more available for everybody to use, uh, uh, whether you're que asking questions of yourself or your employees or your, uh, you know, your clients, if you do consulting of any kind, so that you can get precisely to the heart of the matter and figure out what needs to be done and build a plan. And uh, uh, Owen and I have been working on this. Unfortunately, Owen broke his arm. Uh, so his typing has gotten a little slower. Uh, <laughs> One-handed typing thing doesn't work too good. And uh, so he's trying to master the art of dictating. But we've done part of it already, and it's on the way. I'm going back through Using Your Brain for a Change, which I always thought was a really good book. And I think it was a game changer at the time. It took the focus away from modeling psychotherapy and put it on using your brain 
and uh, take it, putting controls in the brain so that you could hesitate more or less depending upon whether you were talking about dating or overeating. And uh, so that you could change a belief in a heartbeat and get rid of a fear quickly and all of those things that came out of what I believe is the best part of NLP right now. And uh, so that's what I've been working on with books. Uh, most of them are being published by newthinkingpublications.com and, uh, and, and like my new book, uh, Thinking on Purpose, just came out in Italian. And uh, I don't think it would have been able to come out so fast, except that the way in which things are done now are entirely different, you know, with the print on demand and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, thinking on purpose is available everywhere in English. And slowly, bit by bit, we're getting translations done and releasing them. Uh, that we're trying to make it so that we can build communities. Uh, teaching Excellence, which also came out by th NewThinkingPublications.com, uh, we want to build a community which teachers can talk to each other. Uh, and, and by building communities around the books, people will have websites where they can go and talk to each other and chat rooms and all the current things that, you know, that people are using so that people who are interested in neurolinguistic programming and interested in becoming better consultants, better teachers, better trainers, all of those things, that not only can they buy a book, but all of these books like Thinking on Purpose and The New Structure of Magic uh, have, whether they're an ebook or whether they're a hardback, they've got links to them by which I get to talk to the people just like I'm talking to you now. And uh, so every chapter begins with a video, some of the exercises have videos, that, you know, the ability to add sound and pictures into ebooks is what ebooks are all about, as far as I'm concerned. You know, just having it be a digital representation of what's already on paper isn't a giant step forward. But being able to hear my voice and Owen's voice and, 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 and Dr. Bradstock's voice when she's talking about in the chapter in my new book that's about fueling your brain so that you put the right things in your brain, the right minerals, the right foods, the right things so that you can think clearer. Uh, hearing it from, so to speak, the horse's mouth, this is the best thing. And right now with these books, uh, I'm the horse. <laughs> you are the horse and you are the, the, the right horse. Uh, just two things, Richard, I wanted to ask you. So on the, I'm really excited about, you know, all these, all the re-editing and the working you're doing. Uh, and I love, uh, I love, you know, um, I love the book, you know, uh, using your brain for a change. Uh, you know, I, I think kind of what, what I wanted to say. So, so is that book in particular, is that, which ones is coming out first? I, I know I want to talk about the existing books you've got out now in a minute, but I, when are these books, when can we expect them? Because that book was a game changer. Uh, it is still a game changer, and I, I can't wait to, to, to get my hands on that one. When, when are we going to be seeing these new books coming out? Because I know you're, you're nonstop working on these things. Well, it, 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 you know, I'm, I'm hoping that most of them come out next year. Uh, it depends upon how fast I can get them done. And, uh, <laughs> you know, considering, considering this last month, I've done probably 50 radio interviews. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and webinars, I just did one in Italy for, you know, an hour and I'm doing one now for an hour. Uh, you know, there, I, I, I go as quick as I can, and, you know, and I do have a personal life. I know, I know, I know. Now, listen, you're doing, uh, every time I speak to you, what, what, what impresses me about you, Richard, is, 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 is kind of the, the amount of, of work you do and, and how you're constantly updating your game. And as you said, look, whatever you wrote 40, 50 years ago, you've learned so much more. You know so much more now. I mean, God knows what's in your head. You, you said that you don't, no one wants to know that. No one would like to be in your head for a few minutes. I can only imagine <laughs> that. But, you know, you're constantly reinventing and creating. And I love, I love what you're doing. Uh, and you were mentioning about Thinking on Purpose. What's so great about that book? There's so many great things about that book. It's the strategies it has in it. I love, you know, the videos that you and Owen have done together with a QR code. Uh, I love the idea of the eBooks. 
Um, so tell me a little bit more about Thinking on Purpose and how that can help people. Uh, because it, it is a game changer, that book. And, and, well, uh, it's, it's a 15-day plan to have a smarter life, which really means to get smarter. That the currency of living is how you spend your moments. And if you spend your moments worrying, and if you spend your moments thinking about bad memories, and you spend your moments being afraid, it adds up really fast. If you have one bad memory and you think about it for a minute here and two minutes there and three minutes there, and it adds up to 30 minutes, not to mention if you spend an hour a day worrying about stuff, uh, that together is an hour and a half. And boy, now we're talking you know, north of 500 hours in a year, which means in 10 years, we're talking 5,000 hours. And in 40 years, we're talking 20,000 hours that you're planning to either worry about something or remember something unpleasant. And uh, it, if you look at it that way, it's astronomical. And when people say, well, I'm not planning to do it, I just do it. Well, that's not really true because if you're not doing something in your head to make a better plan, uh, then your brain will continue to do what it does. Brain is designed to make things familiar and whatever's familiar, it keeps doing until you have a way of altering it. This book gives you little things you can do. They take 10 minutes. Most of them are not psychological tricks, but neurological tricks. So that if you follow the instructions that you can get rid of bad memories. And uh, if you have a bad memory that you think about every day or three times a week, it all adds up. And if you can make it so that that memory stops popping up by itself, just by doing something that takes five, six, seven minutes. If you have a fear that you're constantly worrying that you're going to be in a situation where the fear will come up. Uh, you know, the biggest fear is of public speaking. The second biggest one is social phobia, of just going up and talking to somebody that you don't know and, you know, introducing yourself and saying hello. Uh, a lot of people have fear of heights, fear of flying, fear of all of these things. And if you can spend, do something that takes 15 minutes, and, and, and get all that time back, then you can make a big plan. You can swap all of this wasted time and make a plan to become more positive. To, to, and and we, you know, there's a day where you increase your confidence and there's a day where you build new beliefs and a day where you make a longer range plan where you go into the future and build something you're really drawn to. There's a, a, a thing about getting over addictive behaviors. There's a little something of everything that I've compiled over the past 50 years. Uh, remember, all the clients that came to me all these 50 years have been given up on by everybody. So I had to build strong things that would get them to be convinced because they would always come in and they'd be rather hopeless. And, and I found out if I could convince them, and there's nothing more convincing than having something change. And if you change the way you think, changes the way you feel, and therefore it changes what you're capable of doing. And uh, that strategy is, 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 is inundated throughout this book. And uh, so far, people have responded to it very positively. Uh, part of the tour I'm doing is, uh, oddly enough, everybody is asking me about stupid behaviors. You know, my book is about being smarter. I'm not an expert on how to get stupid. I'm an expert on how to get smart. And uh, oddly enough, you know, they, every stupid thing that somebody does in the United States, a radio interviewer will bring up out of the news media and go, this stupid thing happened. You know, how do you explain this? And I go, it's not my job to explain it. It's my job to change it. I can tell you how to get smarter, but you know, you know, uh, there's already enough stupidity around. Why would we, why would we want to understand it? Uh, I actually have a chapter uh, in my book, uh, uh, you know, uh, about delusions, uh, you know, of understanding and how, you know, that, you know, overwhelming delusions of understanding can be a big trap. You know, if you understand yourself or you understand your problems, you understand why you are the way you are, then you probably aren't making a plan to be a different person. And the one thing you are is your brain is a learning machine. We are an adaptive organism. We adapt to everything. 
if you take a human being and you put them at 7,000 feet, their blood will get thicker so that they can, they can stay warmer with less clothes. Uh, they all, if you put them where there's less oxygen, their blood will get thinner and they can, you know, uh, they can breathe better. We adapt to environments, maybe not as quickly as we'd like to, but we do. And when you're not adapting, you're not learning. And uh, these are simple tricks to begin to learn to adapt. Thank you, Richard. Um, I think one of the things that, uh, for me, when I was the first time I, I did the NLP training with you quite a few years ago, I remember standing in the middle of the room uh, and I was 38, I think at the time, and I'd done a lot of sales and marketing courses and you know, how to become a better closer, mirror, build rapport and all those kind of things. And I remember I'm standing in the middle of the room at the age of 38 and I'm learning eye accessing cues, nonverbal communication and all these things. And I'm thinking, oh my God, why am I learning these things now? And I remember the, the thing that happened to me was for the first time in my life, I was aware of my thoughts and I was aware of how I could change my thoughts. That, I mean, I know you, because obviously you still do and attend and speak and help and you know, coach and work with so many people. Don't you find it fascinating that people don't spend any time at all about thinking about what they're thinking about or being aware of their thoughts that all of a sudden they realize these things? Well, when, before I came along, you know, there was 160 schools of psychotherapy all arguing about who had the right approach. And uh, although I did study psychology, I just didn't agree with its basic premise, which is that if you understand how you got so screwed up, that suddenly and magically you would be less screwed up. You know, that, you know, we understand how you boil water, but that doesn't make the ability to boil water change temperature. You have to heat it up to a certain temperature, then it boils. And if certain things happen to you and it made you the way you are, it doesn't mean that, that it's permanent. It means that you need whatever all of those things did was made you think a certain way and feel a certain way. And if you change the way you think and change the way you feel, it changes what you're capable of doing. That, uh, you know, oddly enough, you know, uh, most people are paralyzed by fear. And yet, you know, over the years, I've taken thousands and thousands and thousands of people and got them to get over a fear. Uh, you know, people are thinking and they, they always say that, but they're not. You know, they come into me and they go, I don't think I can quit smoking. And they're not really talking and they're not really thinking. What they're doing is remembering. They're remembering how hard it was when they tried in the past. Uh, they're imagining things they've imagined before where they failed and they're planning to fail because they all go, you know, even if I quit for a day or two, it'll get so bad that I'll smoke again. And if they don't see themselves becoming a non-smoker and look at it and want it more than a cigarette, they probably never will. But it's not that hard to change pictures in your head and make them so positive that your feelings get so strong that, you know, when you start to go through withdrawal, you say to yourself, boy, I'm doing exactly the right thing. And you get the same endorphin rush that you get from a cigarette. Uh, and, you know, that's why I've gotten you know, tens of thousand people to quit smoking, to, to give up hard drugs, you know. Uh, you know, as I went through my career, I've worked with a lot of musicians who took more drugs than I could even imagine. And in combinations that were astronomically idiotic. Uh, the ability of human beings to engage in stupid behavior is all around us. Uh, we're going through a political cycle in the United States here where you know politicians are demonstrating stupidity on a daily basis uh, you know they're starting to talk about how it's a right for poor people to live closer to their work and that not only rich people are that that this is a right that somehow or other this is just an inalienable right and i'm sorry that what they're going to do rip down rich houses and build low-income housing I, I can't even imagine why they're even talking about this uh, you know, they want, you know, they want to put a ban on cow farts. I don't even know who thinks of stuff like this. I mean, we have real problems to solve in this country. I mean, real problems that have real solutions. 
And when I hear politicians say stupid stuff like this, I think to myself, these are not problem solvers. You know, I'm not a therapist. I'm, I'm, I'm not somebody who fixes things. I'm an educator. And uh, everybody should think of themselves that way, that, you know, it's all about education and knowing what to do. And when you don't, you do something that doesn't work, that's the time to find something new. And that's what I've done for 50 years. That's why I've written 32 books and most of them have different things in them because I constantly have found new solutions uh, because I'm always faced with new problems. When I worked with the military, they had totally different problems, you know, than an agoraphobic that I had to go over their house. But, you know, a, you know, a psychiatrist once asked me to see an agoraphobic. He'd been visiting this guy at his house for 10 years. And when I went in the first day, I say, he said, well, what are you going to do different than your psychiatrist? And I said, well, the first thing is we're going outside. And he became terrified. And, he, you know, he started to have an anxiety attack. And I, I popped him gently in the stomach with a little punch, which forces people to take a deep breath. And when he took a deep breath, I said, keep breathing deep, because if you don't breathe deep in through your mouth and out through your nose, you can have an anxiety attack. You know, anxiety attacks are where you inhale and then start trying to inhale. It's a bad thing. <laughs> uh, it causes anxiety and stuttering, and it's a bad habit. But once I got him to breathe properly, I got him outside, got him up the street, got him across to the park, and he started to have another anxiety attack. And made a fist, and he went, I'm breathing, I'm breathing, I'm breathing. And here we are, suddenly, a mile from the house, sitting in a cafe, having lunch. And, uh, you know, if, if you look at everything as a psychological problem, you know, stuttering isn't a psychological problem. It, you know, stuttering makes people nervous, but it's not a speech problem either. It's a breathing problem. If you don't breathe properly, and the reason there are periods and commas in sentences is because that's when you're supposed to breathe. John went to the store, comma, inhale. <laughs> he exhale as you talk. He bought a loaf of bread, period. Inhale. And when you get people to breathe properly, they speak properly. Mm. And most of the things that I've done over the years are a lot simpler. Moshe Feldenkrais, who I, one of the people I modeled who did body work and did miracle after miracle after miracle, approached physical problems as if they were a problem in your relationship to gravity. He wrote a book called The Elusive Obvious, which I thought was a fabulous title. Uh, it also is out of print at this time, and that's a shame because it was a wonderful book. Uh, you know, to me, the elusive obvious is, is what we're all in search of. The answers in the end are always easier than the way we've been approaching things. That most of the solutions I found over the years are a lot easier. Uh, the job of a psychologist is terrible. They have to go on an archaeological dig through your entire emotional history to find the root causes of what makes you be stupid today. And to me, I just find that very, very difficult and very time consuming. And I just accept the fact that most, most of what are called emotional problems and psychological problems, you know, are based on stupidity, which makes bad chemical imbalances. And some of those are probably genetic and some of them, I would say most of them aren't. I mean, even when I work with schizophrenics who are severely schizophrenic, their doctors can't tell me what chemical imbalance is there. But I always find that when I pull them off of the drugs and I teach them how to think better, they function better. And uh, to me, you know, whether I'm doing something, training people to do sales or I'm training people to, you know, how to run their employees in a company or how to do selection or recruiting, 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 it's all, it's all, the, it's coming up with good solutions to do things quicker, easier. Uh, at heart, I'm a capitalist and uh, in my country, they're talking about socialism, I think a little bit too much. And I find that when you figure out how to do things quick, easy and efficiently, they become cheaper and more available to more people. Uh, and Richard, uh, uh, Richard, uh, I wanted, I wanted to I wanted, ask you about, to ask you about the, the, so we were talking so about, we were talking about, 
And, 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 and I, one of the I, questions, one of the questions was asking, was asking about visualization. about visualization. How do you learn? How do you learn? How do you people don't make people the right, don't make the right mind, mind, especially mind. where they go. Well, I mean, it, 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 it first, first you, you have to improve the quality of your images. Some people have vivid images with stupid things in them, and, uh, but they also have smart things in them as well. You just have to know the difference between which is which and to construct the kind of images that will send you in the direction you want. Uh, it's no different than talking to yourself. If you say something stupid, you know, you'll get a stupid result. Uh, I, I, I had a guy who worked for me once who, you know, every woman that came into my house looked at him and drooled. And uh, he never seemed to be going out with women, so I, I just assumed he was gay. <laughs> and one day he walked up to me and he said, I was thinking of asking this woman out. And then he said, next fall, it was January. Uh, and I said, I said, that's a long time from now. Why don't you ask her tomorrow? And he looked at me like I had just driven towards him with a Mack truck. Uh, he was terrified. And he had a voice inside his head that constantly kept, you know, telling him, you know, that he was going to get rejected and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, uh, I finally got him to just say better things in a more confident voice. And if you change the way you talk to yourself, it also will change the way you feel. Talking and visualizing and feeling are all mechanisms of thinking. So are smell and taste as well. Our senses don't just come in through the holes in our head. Uh, you know, we have, we got two ears and two eyes and, and, and two nostrils and one mouth. And I think we only have one mouth because we should listen more than we should talk. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Richard, Richard, someone was actually just asking a question, and I know we we, we discussed very briefly uh, teaching. Someone? <laughs> yeah, well, no, there's there's loads of questions here, loads of questions. But one of them uh, was in particular regarding, uh, and I, as I said, we, we you literally we discussed very briefly uh, teaching excellence. But someone was asking, would either teaching excellence or thinking on purpose be a good book to provide or for children to read? He's a, this, his son in particular, this is Tanya, Tanya's uh, son is 11 year old. Well, teaching excellence is a good book for anybody who knows any NLP to read. Uh, to me, it's even better than NLP volume one. It tells you what NLP is. I don't really think of it as a children's book, however. Uh, but if a children is at the reading ability to be able to read it, uh, I would, you know, I wouldn't think it would be a bad thing. I don't think it would be as good a book for children to read as uh, uh, thinking on purpose, you know, or using your brain for a change or something like that. Uh, depends upon what we're talking about. If they're not reading at the right age, then I think the parents should read the book and teach the children how to read. Uh, there are so many learning strategies in that book that should be taught by every teacher in every school. And Kate Benson is really working on that. But uh, I haven't found that teachers, uh, you know, it's, it's not my best selling book. And there's a lot of books out there for teachers, but I don't think they get the message that this is gonna make their job so much easier. Uh, the demand on time of teachers is now so administrative compared to what they should be doing, spending their time teaching people, uh, you know, that uh, if you give people the right strategy to learn something, they'll do it on their own really well. But if you don't, they won't. Uh, you know, it was 45 years ago when I modeled the best speller in a spelling bee in California and started teaching other kids who were supposed to be learning disabled to spell properly. And still, it's not part of the curriculum of most schools. It's ridiculous. You can't learn to spell phonetically. You can't even spell phonetics phonetically. Yeah. Uh, it's, it is ridiculous. It's a fantastic book. And I, I, one of the things I wanted to highlight, it, it is packed with strategies. It isn't a book only for teachers. It's for anyone that literally wants to be able to communicate better and learn strategies to be able to implement things. So I think it's a fantastic book. I have another question here from uh, Mando is asking me about, has there been, and I know you've done a lot of work with the armed forces and helped a lot of people with PTSD. Has there been any advancements on using NLP for treating PTSD, Richard? 
Well, uh, when you say advancement, I don't know where they're starting from. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't find that it's one thing. I find there are all different kinds of post-traumatic stress. And some people are reliving things. Some people, uh, you know, their, their memories of having been, you know, in a war zone for a couple of years are so vivid because of all the adrenaline that's there all the time. And, you know, there's a, you know, you're with a team, so you're really team oriented and, you have all these vivid memories and then they come home and nothing feels real. They can't readjust. And part of it is that you need to turn those memories down and turn up the memories from before they left and their current memories so that they're incredibly big, incredibly bright compared to their memories of the war zone. Uh, I am thinking of starting a project, another project, just what I need. Uh, I did find uh, an organization here, luckily, that has a lot of soldiers with uh, post-traumatic stress. And I'm contacting the head of that organization to find out if we can work something out so I could start a series of interviews and start to catalog the different kinds of post-traumatic stress, at least with soldiers. Uh, to me, I think, you know, that what our armed forces do for us is so valuable that we owe a great debt. And unfortunately, we keep trying to pay those debts with cash. We hire a whole bunch of, you know, in the United States, they hired zillions of therapists to help these guys, and they're not helping them because they don't know how. And, uh, you know, it's like teachers. It's not their fault they don't teach well. They haven't been given the tools to be able to install strategies for people to get work done. There are ways to think that make you mathematical. There are ways to think that get you to be more musical. There are ways to get you to, you know, to read music and play. And there's also a whole different set of strategies to write music. Uh, that's, you know, art, music, literature, football, playing pool, all of these things, you know, have different strategies. And when you have the strategy, you stand a better chance of acquiring the skill and the knowledge. And uh, I really didn't have the time or the access that I needed. And uh, hopefully I'll do better in the future. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is what the meta model is so powerful for. If you ask the right questions, you can really distinguish the difference between what their life was when they considered it normal, because it might not have been that good before anyway. Uh, that does so, you know, getting them be, to be back to who they were is not really what you're trying to do. You're trying to get them to be a new, better person so that whatever it is that's, that's making it so that they, they're not connecting, you know, with the society they live in, whether it's England, Britain, Germany, France, or Japan, or any place, when you come back from, you know, uh, six months to two years, you know, with uh, multiple tours in, you know, a war zone, uh, you need to adjust. Uh, you know, whether it's, uh, it's somebody who comes, you know, who is in a violent episode where they were mugged or raped or something, you know, there are a lot of overwhelming situations where people, you know, afterwards are, are they're, they're mentally adjusted. They've learned the wrong thing from it. And it may have been the right thing in the moment, but afterwards, it's just not the way to think to be able to function and have a happy, productive life. And in the end, you have to adjust your mind and adapt to the future you want to have, not to the past you did have. Thinking is not remembering and piling memories together. Uh, thinking is planning and coming up with new solutions and making your mind work in a way that gets them done as easily and quickly as possible. Well, Richard, that would be, I, I can't wait. I mean, that, that would be amazing. And as you said, uh, someone gave me a fact uh, the other day, which I just could not believe was true, is that they were telling me that out of um, all the different wars in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, there was at, around 11,000 uh, soldiers died. And since or after the war, it was, I think it's around 110,000 have either died by suicide and I don't know what the percentage of them are homeless and it's just it's just unacceptable so I just can't think of anyone better to start working on that and documenting it because you can really help and enhance especially if it's all recorded and then you can you know train we can train these coaches and trainers to, to, to implement these techniques that would be amazing well 
they, you know, these, these poor boys are taught to go to war, but they're not taught to come back. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not an easy thing. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, the truth is you're never entirely back from something like that, but you, you don't need to come back. You need to go on. And, uh, you know, the amount of homeless soldiers in the United States is, is, is embarrassing. It, you know, that's all I can say. We need to do something about it. And I'm going to see what little I can throw into the pile and maybe come up with something that will hopefully be used by a lot of people. Um, anyway, as far as I can tell, there's still a lot of work to do on everything everywhere. <laughs> this is just one of the things. I keep looking around and, and looking at things. I look at institutions of every way, shape, or form, and I go, education, you know, in particular, I go, needs work. You know, it, it should be able to accomplish more, easier, quicker, faster. And the people doing it should be more enthralled by what they're doing, uh, you know. And, you know, it's, you know, you meet salesmen, you know, who hate their job and salesmen who love their job. They're not thinking about it the same way. And I've never found an overwhelmingly successful person that hated what they did. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, and I'm, uh, I'll add to this that Richard always says at the seminars, anywhere he goes and everywhere he goes, he always has enough clients. There's always clients in the room. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, Someone was just asking me, uh, what's the best way to start with NLP? And obviously, I'm going to say, hey, start with the courses if you can. Ideally, just go and do an NLP practitioner. But this is the beauty of what you created, Richard, with obviously the training and the certified training uh, where, you know, you are educating and teaching people to then go out and use these skills. You know, so, hey, they do a seven, nine day practitioner. They do the nine day master practitioner. And, and these coaches, trainers, therapists, these NLPers are going out there and creating massive difference. So how many, you know, just the amount of work that you've done already and, and the reach that you've had and how many people this has helped is just, a, it's just a blessing for all of us. So I wanted to thank you on behalf of everyone because you don't, you know, I don't think enough people thank you um, and appreciate what you've done. Yeah, I think people, like when I wanted to learn hypnosis, I went to every great hypnotist and studied with them and I read every book I could find. And I have to admit, 80% of them weren't worth reading. And, uh, but the 20% made it worth wasting the rest of the time. And, uh, you know, a lot of people go to an NLP training, they get a certificate and they go, I know NLP. It ain't that easy. You really, you know, you go to a prac course, you got to go out and practice. And then you got to come back, maybe do it again a little bit later on. It, uh, you know, there's loads of people stuck at various levels of my development. Don't be one of them. Stay current in your field and learn as much as you can. Read as much as you can. And you should understand that this is all about neurology. So reading what goes on in the field of neurology is a good thing. I read probably every week. I couldn't even count the number of journal articles I read in medicine, neurology, uh, you know, the audio, audio research, uh, you know. There's all kinds of journals about everything. Every medical specialty has a journal. And, you know, a lot of what you read is nonsense because most journal articles are very slow conversations. Somebody says something and six months later, somebody responds to it. Uh, but if you gather up a year's worth and read through them real quick, sometimes you find fascinating things. And uh, I've learned a lot from the medical journals and a lot from the neurological journals. Uh, you know, I think the first person to really notice accessing cues was Dorothy Kimura that I quoted in my book when I first told people about accessing cues. She noticed the visual one, visual remembered, and she couldn't understand it. She threw it as there's a little thing in journal articles where they go, this quirky thing happened while we were trying to prove our point. Or in most scientific things, they're trying to disprove what they believe to prove that it is true. The null set hypothesis. Uh, by the way, in your thing about NLP, you called it a pseudoscience. It's not a pseudoscience and it's not a science either. It's, it's a model. It's a model that tells you what to do. It's like a cookbook. Uh, you know, a cookbook isn't pseudoscience. A cookbook tells you how to make a chocolate cake. This tells you how to, how, how to influence your neurology so you get over a fear. How to influence your neurology so you become more motivated. 
And we don't make scientific claims because we don't do that sort of a thing. We know whether it works or not by whether or not the person can get on the elevator or not. If you can't get on the elevator, then what you did didn't work. So you do it differently until it does. And, uh, you know, this, you know, there's different kinds of scientists. There's theoretical scientists, and then they're the kind of scientists that build stuff. And the ones that build things don't think they're done until it works. Uh, toaster isn't a toaster unless it makes toast. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and that's what happens at the courses. You know, we, you know, Richard, well, we're literally teaching him all these skills throughout the, throughout the seven days. Or, and then, you know, Richard brings all these people on stage and all of a sudden these phobias, anxieties, limiting beliefs that have been there for 5, 10, 20, 30 years, all of a sudden within a matter of minutes, 10, 15 minutes, you've got people in a lift, you've got people in a box testing those claustrophobics. <laughs> uh, bringing the I big like that one when you put the claustrophobic in the box. I, I like to sit on the top and ask them if they're all right. And then we go, I'm okay. <laughs> And they don't want to get out. Um, we bring in snakes too, big snakes. I find that's very impressive. I yeah. did that on TV here once in America. And uh, I got probably more feedback from that than almost anything I did on TV. Yeah, that was amazing. That was, what did you have? Six minutes, was it? Yeah, there was somebody else wouldn't shut up. It was a talk show. And they kept coming in and going, you know, first they said I had 20 minutes, then it was 15, then it was 10. And then they said, maybe we should reschedule. And I said, No, nah, I flew to New York, I'll get it done. So I had to talk through the commercial, but I got it done. And you know, somebody who couldn't, wouldn't even consider touching a snake and was terrified of rubber snakes, <laughs> uh, suddenly was holding a big snake. And uh, we do that in the seminars all the time. Uh, but, you know, because there's only two natural fears, loud noises and falling. All the rest are learned. And if you can learn to be afraid of something, you can learn that it doesn't matter so much. Richard, loads of questions coming in. Someone's asking about OCD, uh, addressing it. I don't know what that means, but also how, how can it be done effectively? Or how, I suppose, how can OCD help you uh, in life if you are an OCD person? I know you've had a loads of OCDs working for you, which has been... <laughs> Uh, leave it to an obsessive compulsive to repeatedly ask a question. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of people with OCD. I don't look at it as a problem. I, I, I look at it as a highly motivated person doing stupid stuff rather than, than good stuff. So uh, my job is to change their list, you know, instead of opening and closing the door 15 times. I mean, I had one that kept on plugging the refrigerator because they were afraid it was going to burst into flames. Cold things don't usually get hot. Uh, you know, I've never once in my life heard of a refrigerator bursting into flames. Uh, but, you know, they turned off their heat, they turned off everything. And uh, that's because, you know, they were, it's, 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 remember, it's not the refrigerator scaring them, it's the idea in their head scaring them. And all OCD behavior are rituals of comfort. And once you realize that, then you need to change what the rituals are. So they become rituals of success. So they obsessively do things that make them happy, that they obsessively think things that get them to be productive. And uh, it's not really a different formula than anything else I do. Uh, you know, and most psychiatrists were very willing to give me their obsessives <laughs> to, to work with in the early days because they drove them nuts because obsessives will call you constantly. And, you know, there weren't even cell phones in those days. And psychiatrists, you know, for some reason never left their office and their phone would be ringing off the hook and, and their service would be calling them at night. And so, you know, when they heard about me, they would, the first patient they would refer away would be an obsessive. And I find them delightful. I give them long lists of things to do and, uh, you know, and get them to be afraid of what they should be afraid of losing all of the moments of their life and uh, letting their world get smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, which is what happens, you know, they'll end up in a room with nothing to eat and, you know, uh, staring at the wall and, uh, you know, it, because, you know, if you keep building new fears and then avoiding them, you know, the world is going to get really small. And uh, once they become obsessive about, you know, finding things that they can enjoy 
and obsess about relaxing, which is the big one, uh, they just become, they become more functional. Doesn't mean they're not kind of OCD anyway, they're just OCD about different things. I mean, I'm pretty OCD myself, really, if you think about it. I don't, I don't find it a problem. I like to finish things. Some people like to start things. I like to finish things. Um, Richard, I've got someone that um, is, is coaching, training people, but they, they actually work with kids that are in gangs. And uh, the question- Sorry, I didn't hear what you just said. Yeah, it's someone that's working with uh, kids that are, are in gangs. And the question is how to help people, how to help them to overcome these bad habits of recurring into doing the same kind of thing. Well, I, 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 you know, again, you know, if they're working with people in gangs, uh, you know, gang behavior is, you know, it is, is something that might function when you're 14 to give you protection in a dangerous neighborhood and might get you a little cash selling drugs on the side, but it really isn't a life plan. That one always ends up in prison or dead or worse. And, uh, you know, the trouble is, is if you have short movies in your head, you have short plans. But if you don't think you're going to have a long life that can lead to success, I grew up in neighborhoods filled with gangs. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they went by ethnic origin in the city that I grew up in, you know, and there were Chinese gangs and, you know, and, uh, you know, there were different, the Chinese gangs fought with the Vietnamese who fought with these people who fought with the Italians. And, you know, it was over territory and drugs and fireworks and all of this stuff. But, you know, it, it, when you looked at it, they, you know, in the end, they all were ending up in prison. They all got hurt. They all got something bad was constantly happening to them or their families. And, you know, if you look in your future and you want to have a family and you want to have love and you want to have good income, you have to find a smarter way to do things. Loads of people have gotten out of the gang life and become successful. It's far from impossible. And we need to build models of what they did in their mind to change it. And it'll all come down to making a better movie and making a decision. And people go, you know, I can't quit the gang because they'll kill me. And I go, well, then maybe you need to move. Move somewhere else where that nobody knows you. Uh, sometimes starting over has to have a big step in the beginning of the plan. But, you know, uh, first they have to have in their mind something which is beliefs that believe that this life is not as it's see if that's the best life they can imagine that's the one they'll live in because you know it's familiar they grew up in it you know the toughest guy in the street you know got all the got all the respect but he doesn't get as much respect as warren buffett does and uh, <laughs> uh to me you know uh what most people do warren buffett once said and this is a quote right out of my book warren buffett said when most people play the stock market, they, they, they look at all the data to convince themselves they're right about doing something, which is why they don't make money. They don't look at the data and draw a conclusion from it based on the data. And if you look at all the people in the United States, instead of just your neighborhood, the people who are doing really well aren't gang members. And uh, you know this is what people have to do they have to look at, you know, in this country, there, there are 350 million. There's over 60 million in England. Which ones are really doing well? Well, it's not just because they grew up upper class and white. By the way, most of my really screwed up clients are second generation wealthy white people. And a lot of them, you know, are, are on a downward spiral into nothing. So having advantages in the beginning can be helpful, but it isn't necessarily. I started with less than nothing, and I'm doing really well. And I decided when I was really young that that wasn't the life I wanted to lead. I didn't want to be a gang member. Uh, I knew plenty of them, but I focused on a longer range plan. I figured the people who went to college did better, so I went to college. Uh, and, you know, I didn't go to, I thought maybe I'd become a college professor. And as it turns out, when I found out how much money they made, I knew they weren't the successful people I thought they were. Uh, they didn't make the kind of money that I was planning to make, so I had to create something of my own. Uh, people come to the United States 
to escape gangs, open a dry cleaner or a restaurant, and uh, build a successful life. Uh, there are loads of millionaires that came here to this country and to England with nothing. And uh, if you're already here and you have nothing, then it seems like you're halfway there. And if you get that in your mind, you can make a bigger, better, brighter plan. Great advice. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I have a question. This is the last question, uh, because we've got a few other things I would like to ask you. Uh, it's a question that basically is, what is the similarity or the difference between conscious observation during meditation and a trance for positive suggestibility? Well, th those terms are not terms I would use, so it's kind of hard to answer. Too many nominalizations in that statement. Yeah. But, you know, uh, meditations, you know, of which there are loads of different kinds, uh, versus trance where, uh, you know, uh, somebody is directing you while you're in trance. The difference between the two, uh, to me, is really simple. Most people meditate to achieve a certain state of consciousness, and it's not profoundly different than many hypnotic states. There are loads of altered states, which is why I use devices like the mind mirror to read so I'd know when people were in alpha and where they were in alpha and how stable they were in alpha and whether there were theta spikes or, and how far apart those spikes were. Uh, because when people, because to me, the trance state shouldn't just be a state where you go and sit. It's not a swimming pool, uh, you know, where you go into an altered state and you just hang out there for a while. It's where you go into that state to achieve something specific. Uh, you know, I use trance to go in, you know, to do everything. If in, in trance states, you can lower your blood pressure, your heart rate. You can do that meditating. You know, people who meditate every day, you know, are, are better at being relaxed. They make excellent hypnotic subjects because they're very familiar with being in altered states. So it takes less time. They're, it's easier for me to get them into an altered state when I need to achieve or do something specific. Um, you know, some people, you know, come in very, very nervous. They've never relaxed and never meditated, but they still make good hypnotic subjects. As you know from the seminars, uh, I have as yet to bring anybody on the stage and have them not. They may not be certain they were in an altered state, but pretty much everybody watching is pretty convinced. Yeah. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of people think when you go into a deep trance, you can't see or hear anything. And, and that's death. That's a different one. Uh, but there, you know, there are so many altered states that the brain can go into. But uh, to me, you know, there's, this, this world needs to relax a lot more and not worry about stuff. Uh, this, all this political correctness has gotten out of hand. Every, people are hunting for things to be upset about. People have killed themselves because of what people say on their Facebook page. You know, turn it off for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know, I, I really, I, you know, the fact that you can bully somebody online is ridiculous. You know, uh, you know, when I grew up, you know, a lot of people said bad things about me. It's been this, and it's never stopped. But, you know, it doesn't, you know, you have the choice of going, oh, my God, people are thinking bad things about me and having an anxiety attack. Or you have the ability to just say inside your head, what a freaking idiot. They should be worried about themselves, not me. And, uh, you know, it, 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 if people don't learn to relax more in life, then they, you know, it affects your health, it affects your brain, and it's a big waste of time. Uh, falls in that category really stupid and when you do really stupid stuff you have to learn to stop it and do something smarter thanks Richard that's that's great advice and it is so true with so many people with social media being dictated by their phones I, I was reading well some of the information I've been sharing so um, well we spent an average of 27 years sleeping uh, seven years watching television four years on social media we spent an average of four hours a day you know if we just spent uh, 20 minutes just thinking about what we're thinking about we, or meditating or relaxing, you know, where the world would be a much better place. Uh, do you meditate, Richard? Uh, well, I, I, I spend a lot of time in trance. I, you know, I don't call it meditation, but basically it is. Mm. Um, that, to me, when you go into an altered state, it gives you the chance to pierce the veil and to look at all the rest of the world. 
uh, to me, sometimes you just have to drain every thought from your mind so that you can feel alive and see that everything is alive. Remember, this universe isn't solid. It's a vibrating mass. And every time we look, you know, the molecule is supposed to be the smallest thing. And then there were particles. And now we don't even know what's there. Uh, that, that the whole universe is vibrating with life and especially on this planet. And sometimes you just need to look out the window and look at the trees blowing in the wind, let yourself go into an altered state, and feel alive. If you don't stop and feel really alive, then you don't ask questions like, how wonderful can I feel? How much can I get done? If you're not asking the right questions, you're not headed in the right direction. That is so true. absolutely love that. Uh, Richard, well, we're nearly coming to the end of our time. So you're coming to London uh, in October um, and we've got a good run of seminars. So get the life you want with Paul McKenna. Uh, we're going to be running that one again. Um, it's always a fun, it's a fun uh, show. It's not your first rodeo. Uh, tell me about get the life you want, because I, uh, one of the things I really insist with NLP is, you know, these guys that know it all because they did the prac uh, four years ago or or, you know, they've read four books. I always tell them, you know, you don't stop learning. You've got to carry on learning. And this is what I, that's what I love about the Get the Life You Want. It's not only for those that don't know anything about NLP. It's for those that do know or understand NLP. It's a great opportunity to model, to, to, to learn. What, what, what's, your, what's your biggest kick out of the Get the Life You Want? Why do you love that seminar? Well, I, I, I like that seminar because between... Paul and I, we've got a lot of years under our belt of doing training and doing hypnosis and changing people. And uh, the book, Get the Life You Want, when I wrote it, uh, I wrote it to be a cookbook so that, you know, if you had too much fear, you could get rid of it. You know, you could literally go through, you know, you need more confidence, you do this. And it, you know, it, 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 you, don't, you don't even need to read it cover to cover. You could literally thumb your way through and find what fits your problem and do that. And uh, uh, this course, literally, we run through the gamut of the most common things that get in the way and chew up people's life and time. And, you know, we tell a lot of stories about clients and we have a good time. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's edutainment. And uh, edutainment gives you the chance to enjoy the process of, of literally right before your eyes watching somebody change their life and then doing it yourself. Uh, because none of this stuff is out of the grasp of, of a person, uh, you know. I don't care what you do for a living or how many years of education you have or don't have, trust me, you can all do this. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things and it, to me, it's, it's one of the more fun seminars because we're really there to play and learn and have a good time. You know, it's not, it, it's not overly serious. People who have already had a lot of training, it gives them a chance to watch the tools in action. Uh, because I don't just do it to the people on the stage. I pretty much am doing it all the time to everybody. Uh, let's face it, for 50 years I've been a hypnotist. And whether you know it or not, I'm doing it all the time. <laughs> you can't help yourself. Um, I, I've seen so many great stories. It's very fun, very, very fun. It's very entertaining, very engaging. Very practical because we've got a great team of assistants. There. But I'm doing three seminars, right? Yeah, well, we do get the life you want, but I'm saying we get the life you want in particular. It's, it's lots of fun, very practical. And, and one of the things that I, I, I love about it, because we get these testimonials, oh, I went to get the life you want and I stopped smoking. Or I went to get the life you want and I don't know how, I've, I've all of a sudden start losing weight. There's all these things that you both do, planting those little seeds in there and people don't even realize. So it's, 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 it's a lot of fun to watch you playing with people. It's lovely. Um, so yes, after that, the personal enhancement, Richard. So this is, um, the event you do in London only once a year. And we, we're technically nearly sold out. We've only got a couple of seats left. The personal enhancement, um, is I, I'm obviously one of my perks of working with you is me being able to sit in that room, uh, with those uh, 15 lucky people that, you know, apply to, to get involved in there. And that's where you literally uh, work with people in helping them. Uh, to really enhance their life, to tune up that brain. Tell us a little bit about the personal enhancement because it's such a life changer. Well, the personal enhancement was designed not to train anybody. Mm. It's where I take the massive amount of skill I have 
people give me lists of the things they want in their life. And uh, I go around the room and as they're telling me about it, I'm working with them, but I may be working with the one I'm talking to, or I may be working with the rest of them. Uh, I, it, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot, a lot of deep trance and it's a lot of covert work and a lot of overt work where we just kind of go through and try to give people a clean slate and a new direction in life. Um, they give me a wish list and it's the wish list tells me not only what they're, they're asking for, what they think they need, but it also tells me what's not on the list. And sometimes, you know, what we don't want and we're not interested in is exactly what we need. And so most people leave there fired up in a new way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice for me to be able to just do things to people and not explain them. And then after that, we start the prac course where I have to do things and explain them and show them and make it so that people can do it themselves. And the personal enhancement thing, people may not end up with the skill, but they end up with powerful changes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the practitioner, master practitioner, we still have got a few seats left, but nearly sold out. Well, Richard, is there anything else that you would like to add? I want to thank you so much. As always, it's been so, you know, so many things we've learned here today. Anything you would like to share? Well, I just want to remind everybody, change the way you think. It will change the way you feel and therefore change what you do. Uh, it's always a good idea to look on the whole list of websites I have richardbandler.com, purenlp.com, nlplifetraining.com, uh, you know, uh, newthinkingpublications.com. There's new things going up all the time on that. Uh, it's, uh, you know, to me, there's a lot to do, and it's a wonderful time to be alive, given all the things that are available to us, like this, you know. 30 years ago, I wouldn't even have been able to imagine a webinar. And look, here I am doing one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, and a great one too. Richard, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to seeing you in London in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you. Take care. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Hope to see you soon. Take care.